Hello, everyone. Matt Clark, research analyst with Money and Markets, here with your weekend edition of the Bull and the Bear podcast. Now, this this time we're gonna we're gonna take a little bit different uh, a different tone, I guess. We're gonna just do things a little bit differently. Uh, in, in the past, you would hear uh, myself. Uh, as well as uh, Charles, uh, Charles Sizemore, editor of Greens on Fortunes and chief investment strategist Adam O'Dell. Uh, we would talk about three different stocks in a particular sector and kind of give you our, our impressions of, of what we thought about that using our own research and our own techniques and, and tell you whether we thought they were ones for your portfolio or not. Well, we're going to change that up a little bit. And by change that up, what I'm going to do is each one of the three of us are going to come on. Uh, I've got all, all three of us are together today. And we're each going to give you one buy recommendation each. So by the end of this video, you're going to have three stocks that you could take to the bank and put in your portfolio. So uh, it's kind of a new and exciting thing, and, and, and I, I really can't wait to get things started. So uh, first, I'm going to bring in uh, Green Zone Fortunes editor Charles Sizemore uh, to start things off here. And, you know, it's a, it's a different thing, but, uh, you know, pretty excited. I like to hear kind of what, I, you know, we, these could come from, these could be any stocks, any sector. Uh, they could be ETFs. They could be whatever. It's, it, the door is wide open in terms of, uh, what the three of us may bring to the table. So, you know, if you're listening uh, at home and you obviously are, then get your pencils ready and, and get ready to take down some notes. And I'm going to start things off with Charles Sizemore, editor of Green Zone Fortune. Charles, first off, welcome uh, all the way from Peru uh, this week. So uh, glad, glad you're joining us uh, from, from South America. But uh, I, I'll let you kind of be the inaugural kickoff in terms of giving us uh, your, 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 your pick for today. Right, because remember, the, the two guinea pigs running on a hamster wheel here that are powering my internet could give out at any time, so uh, we, have to be, we have to get me out of the way here. But uh, yeah, so my, my theme uh, this week is um, the failure to return to normal. Uh, my, my theme is once COVID is long gone and, and li life is more or less you know, back to normal, some things just don't go that way. And one of those issues is... Um, uh, buying things online. So I, I don't think that uh, we ever, you know, once you get used to buying things online, you don't go retrograde and then decide to go frequent, uh, you know, the local brick and mortar shop again. Now, a lot of that's already priced in in stocks like Amazon. Now, I think Amazon is a fantastic company. I think it's a great long term holding, but a lot of optimism is already already built into that. So I'm looking, you know, beyond those obvious names to more of like a sort of a pick and shovel approach here. And a stock that I really like right now is international paper. The first thing you think of when you think international paper is hold on, you're buying a paper company. Didn't you just say the world's going digital? Why would you buy a paper company? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. To start, their biggest business is not copy paper. That is part of their business. They do that. I'll get into more of that here in a minute. But the biggest part of their business is actually making cardboard boxes and chipping. Basically, all the those all those boxes that end up on your doorstep from Amazon, all of those come from somewhere, right? And it, it's it's international paper that makes a lot of those, not specifically from Amazon per se, but but just a lot of the the, the packing that goes into stuff that ends up on your front door comes specifically from international paper. So uh, where it gets fun is this is already a, a highly rated stock for us. It rates 68 on the green zone model. That's firmly in bullish territory. Now that's not in strong bullish territory of 80 or stronger, but it's still quite good. Uh, where it really excels is it, it's, it's, a, it's a great low volatility stock and it's a great value stock. It scores very highly on those, on those metrics. Where it actually falls a bit short is one in size, and there's not much we can do about that. It's a, it's a large company, so it's going to rate low on size. But uh, it, it rates low on, on growth. And part of that is because the traditional paper business, you know, the, the copy paper that you'd you know, the, the, the big ring of paper you find in the office. That business has been in decline for a long time. But here's the catalyst. Here's where it gets fun. International Paper just announced last month that they're planning to spin off that part of their business. They're going to be a pure play on packaging. So that's, you know, that's the, the, the key here. You're going, this is already a highly rated stock. I believe it's going to be vastly higher rated once uh, this spinoff is complete, and you are going to see the growth right now. It's gonna, there's going to be a lag, of course, before this shows up in the data. But you should start seeing the, the good positive growth trends from the packaging. That will not be 
bogged down by the traditional paper business. So you are going to see, I think you're going to see a big reevaluation of this stock by Wall Street when they see it as more of a secondary way to, to buy into the Amazon revolution. So uh, that's my pick. I wrote about it recently in, on moneyandmarkets.com. So uh, by all means, go check it out. Very good. So international paper, that's an interesting play on, on packaging and the kind of a pick and shovel in terms of online shipping and online shopping and how, that's, uh, how, how that is expected to uh, not really taper off, but actually probably expand even more despite uh, even once we're out of the coronavirus pandemic, when and if that ever actually happens. So, and, and that does bring up a good point. I do want to remind everyone, make sure you are going to moneyandmarkets.com each and every day. Sign up for our daily free e-letter. You'll see insights from myself, from Charles, and from my, uh, the next person up uh, on deck to give us his pick, and that's Chief Investment Strategist Adam O'Dell. Uh, just make sure you go to moneyandmarkets.com. You get a free e-letter each and every day. Uh, to give you safe and profitable investment information. And Adam, um, you know, I won't ask for your, your take on international paper because I want to ju just jump right in. I'm very curious to hear kind of what, uh, what, what stock you're thinking about today. Uh, well, actually, I do like international paper, paper both uh, on paper and in theory as far as, uh, as, as the uh, investment thesis there that Charles laid out. So I'll give a thumbs up to that. But, uh, and not to one-up you, Charles, but uh, relative to your uh, bullish stock rating, I found a, a stock this week that I want to share that has a strong bullish rating. So I did find a stock that has an 85 rating on our overall six factor green zone model, uh, you know, near and dear to your heart, Charles, it's a value stock. It's a quality dividend paying stock. And at the same time, it's still a high growth stock. So those are the three categories in which it rates the highest as far as the six factors. So before I share the, uh, the individual pick, the actual stock that I'm recommending today, I want to talk about the sector in which the stock operates. And that's the energy sector, uh, more specifically the, the old traditional uh, crude oil and natural gas sector. And, I think the theme here is that you want, you want to think about narratives that are in the news and sometimes the narratives kind of get overblown or they get, you know, get too far ahead of themselves over their ski, so to speak. And sometimes you want to fade that narrative. And the narrative in uh, oil and gas has been that electric vehicles are, are going to take over and sustainable um, energy sources like wind and solar are going to take over. And I 100% believe that. But I think the miscalculation that the market may be making is that that, that transition is going to happen instantaneously or even much sooner than it actually will. And then the implication of that is that once we move over to electric vehicles and, and sustainable energy, that the, the crude oil market and the natural gas market, that they just go away, they become you know, back to dinosaurs, so to speak, um, you know, instantaneously. And I think that a lot of the pessimism uh, that you see in the, in the stock prices of oil and gas stocks since 2014, I mean, these have been, been in a downtrend since 2014, I think the pessimism at this point is a little bit uh, overdone. And I think that you can actually be a contrarian at this point and look at buying some energy stocks that have seemed to have bottomed and seemed to have started to tick higher and, and establish new shorter term uptrends. So one of the, I mean, if you look at the charts, I'm gonna pull out some up now, you may not be able to see them, but you know, a broad sector ETF like XLE, that's the spider energy sector ETF, that's currently down 50% still from its 2014 highs. And in March of 2020, it was down as much as 76%. If you look within that sector, uh, there are two kind of industry groups within that, the oil and gas exploration companies and then the oil and gas service companies. So the oil and gas exploration companies are currently down 70% still from their 2014 highs. And the uh, energy, the oil and gas uh, equipment uh, stocks, XES is the ETF uh, that tracks that, XES. Those stocks are down 83% still from their 2014 highs. So the reason I point that out is it's not that uncommon for an individual stock to be down 70, 80, or 90%. And individual stocks go to zero all the time. There are businesses that just simply go out. So I'm not saying that go out and find an individual stock that's down 80% and buy it just because it's down 80%. But when an entire sector of the U.S. economy and the global economy, an entire sector that's as integral as energy, becomes so far oversold that it's down 70 or 80 percent, you have to start looking at being a contrarian at that point. Uh, you know, the, I think the energy sector now is only worth 2 percent of the S&P 500 uh, market cap, and it used to be in the teens. So I really think that uh, energy, even traditional energy like oil and gas and natural gas, is going to have something of a phoenix moment where it rises from the ash ashes and, uh, and it really has a, a strong rally ahead. Also speaking about narratives, I mean the narrative uh, before election day was that if Joe Biden was elected president that he would absolutely kill the oil and gas industry. 
But I find it really interesting that since the election day result was known on around uh, November 6th, the, the top performing sector since then is XLE, the energy sector ETF. So that to me shows you that you kind of have to be skeptical of the narrative. Sometimes the narratives can get overdone and uh, you can find investment opportunities by playing contrarian to them. So my pick today is um, Delic Logistics Partners LP and the ticker symbol is DKL. So DKL doesn't uh, pull uh, crude oil out of the ground and it doesn't uh, you know, make rigs. Uh, it basically is a midstream company that gathers crude assets, moves them through pipelines and moves them with trucks and then puts them to the terminal and helps uh, wholesale market those crude assets. So it's basically like a middleman. And the reason I like that play is that the oil and gas producers and even the equipment companies that, that put uh, rigs in the ground that do offshore uh, drilling or do shale drilling, they, they have very capital intensive businesses. And certainly, uh, you know, Delic has put a lot of money into their pipelines. But since 2014, the, these stocks have been going down. But Delic, for the past 31 quarters consecutively, has raised their quarterly dividend. I mean, Charles, you're going to love this. They pay a forward dividend of about 9% right now. And again, they have not missed a single quarterly payment since 2014 when all these stocks started going down. In fact, they've been raising their dividend. So that's uh, a large part of why it rates so highly on our value, quality, and growth scores uh, for our Green Zone Six Factor rating model. It's basically it's a cheap stock. It has a PDE ratio of 10. Uh, it has good profit margins. It has a, a net profit margin of almost 20%, which is great. The earnings per share uh, over the past one year have, have uh, grown by 40%. Uh, the dividends over the past five years have grown at an annual rate of 13%. So this is basically a cash cow. They pay out about 80% of their income to shareholders in the form of those quarterly dividend payments. So I think that this is a great play on the energy sector. It's already done well and survived through a really, really tough time for the energy sector. And I think the energy sector is due to bounce back. I mean, I'm not gonna say it's gonna take over prominence and, and put solar and wind and EV you know, back in the gutter and, and, and not um, let those new technologies come to the market, but I think it's gonna take a lot longer for that transition to happen. And I think that at, basically at these oversold levels that energy is a good play right now. So again, my pick is kind of a bounce back play. It's a contrarian play on Delic Logistic Partners and that ticker symbol is DKL. Very interesting. I, I, I like it, but it, it kind of moves a little contrary to where I'm going. I, it, a little bit, not, not, not too much, but um, the, the, the stock I'm looking at, I, I have a little bit of a connection to. Um, I spent about you know, a little more than five years as, as the editor of a business publication in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, it's known as the upstate. It encompasses all the way from Spart from the North Carolina line, all the way to Anderson on the Georgia line in that upper part of, of North of South Carolina. And, and during my time in the upstate, um, business there was on fire. Uh, population exploded, you know, residential development was massive because you know there was so many people moving into the area uh, because of all this business expansion and one of the big reasons that business uh, was so good and it actually continues to be good I don't want to suggest that Greenville is not good it actually is um, is because BMW North America the, the the company out of German out of Munich Germany uh, their manufacturing arm in North America is in Spartanburg uh, which is right kind of in between uh, Greenville and Charlotte uh, a little closer to Greenville and, and it's, it's the only U.S. manufacturing facility that, that, is, that BMW has. In fact, all the X2s, X3s, X4s, X5s, X6s, and X7 BMW SUVs you see on the road were all produced in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And that's globally. Uh, and, and they have a nice supply chain route. Uh, and, and they have a nice transportation hub as they're able to move their cars uh, built along the, uh, at the, uh, the inland port in, in Greer all the way down to the port of Charleston uh, to ship out internationally. That's not the story. Additionally, in the upstate, you've got French tire maker Michelin. Michelin makes uh, very popular tires, uh, other rubber products. Their North American headquarters is also uh, in Greenville. And, you know, so, and both companies experienced massive growth in production during my time in, in Greenville. But having those two big manufacturing facilities also spurred growth for their suppliers. These are small companies that uh, build components for BMW, that, that build machinery for Michelin. They popped up everywhere, everywhere from, from Spartanburg to Anderson. There were, there were tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers for BMW and Michelin everywhere. 
And it's actually one of those suppliers that I'm going to recommend today. And I'm not recommending it because it supplies BMW. I'm recommending it because I think they're going to have a big part to play in the growing electronic vehicle, uh, uh, electric via electronic vehicle, electric vehicle manufacturing space. Now, I agree with Adam in that I don't think the transition to EV is going to happen like that. It's not. It's going to take time. There's still some develop. Uh, there's still some technology that needs to be developed. Um, there's still issues with charging. Uh, you know, it'd, it'd be very difficult for me to drive from here in South Florida back up to Greenville in an all electric vehicle because there's very little places I could actually charge it. So that that's a long distance to go without being able to do so. So you know, there is something to be said that it's going to take some time. However, consider that in 2019, uh, the global market size for EV was around 115 billion dollars. Now, Acumen Research and Consulting, which is a, a very big research firm, they're projecting that market size to jump as high as 567.2 billion by 2026. So again, we're talking about five years out. So that kind of fits in a little bit with, with what Adam was discussing in terms of EV not necessarily jumping in and taking over the auto market tomorrow, because it's not gonna happen. But you know, it's a massive increase in a short amount of time. And what it means is that there's going to be more vehicle producers that are going to invest more money in building EVs uh, in hopes of gaining market share. We, I, are, I think I saw something just this morning that GM is hoping to uh, completely cease all uh, gasoline uh, produced vehicles by, I believe, 20, I want to say 2030 um, in hopes of reducing that, that, that carbon emission and, and reducing that dependence on oil. Um, but again, so now you're starting to see more and more players step up to the plate and challenge companies like Tesla uh, or Neo or, or you know, those already established EV companies that you know. Now, back in 2015, I, I had an opportunity to sit down with BMW manufacturing president, was then president, Manfred Ericker. And, and you know, we talked about the future of BMW manufacturing and, and he told me the company was actually starting to shift its focus on things like alternative power engines, hybrids, and increased connectivity between vehicles and the internet. And that was back in 2015. That was really before, you know, we saw a lot of this hype um, with Tesla and these other companies. Um, and, and, you know, GM, Volkswagen, BMW, uh, they're all working to catch up with Tesla to get a piece of that $562.2 billion pie. Uh, and they can't do it alone. They've got to have suppliers um, in place to make that reality. They can't, you know, it not, it, you, you might think that everything is, is built within a factory it actually isn't. There are parts that are shipped in, and then those parts are Im implemented on the factory line to build a body and white vehicle. And that leads me to my recommendation. And, and what I'm looking at today is Magna International Incorporated. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange under MGA. That's M-G-A. Uh, it's a company that designs and develops and manufactures automotive systems, assemblies, modules, components, and all sorts of things. And actually, they do they actually do full-on uh, a vehicle assembly, and they are in North America, Europe, and Asia. Its annual production capacity was about uh, 200,000 vehicles in 2018. That's 2018, and it was and it and made it the one of the largest, if not the largest, contract manufacturer for vehicles globally. Uh, and the company is actually moving ahead rather rapidly with partnerships to produce systems and components for electric vehicles. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In 2019, they signed a deal with uh, Beijing Auto. Uh, and the uh, Zhenjiang government in China to create a joint EV production venture in China. Production capacity could be as much as 180,000 vehicles per year. Uh, they also reached an agreement with Google affiliate Waymo uh, to help with system integration on electric vehicle for Google. Uh, and then this year, and, and last year in 2020, uh, they struck a deal with uh, Fisker, uh, not the Scissors, um, but the actual startup company Fisker, to produce Fisker's Ocean SUV. Fisker's forecast that it could be, it could build about 360,000 of these vehicles per year by 2025, which is probably a little bit liberal of an estimate to, to suggest they could build that many. But, um, you know, between Fisker and, and, and Magna, that, that production capacity is, is possible. They also recently just partnered with LG Electronics, popular cell phone and TV manufacturer, to supply electric motors, inverters, and onboard chargers for EV. So, um, and these partnerships have pushed Magna stock to, to, to solid new highs. They came off a low price of around $23 uh, in March, uh, that the stock has now moved about 226% higher to more than $77 a share a week ago. It's, it's dropped a little bit, um, but it's starting to move back to test some resistance back up at 77. Um, sales did fall in 2020 uh, from 2019 to 2020, 20, about 
Um, and that's due to production stops because of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and its earnings were actually cut in half in 2020 because of those production stops. But I think that's temporary. Magna's earnings hit a low of about $3.08 a share in 2020, but forecasts see those earnings topping $9 a share in 2023. Uh, and that's a 193% increase in just three years. Um, and, and I'm going to do you guys all one better in terms of looking at the six factor green zone ranking system. Um, Magna International actually ranks a 92 overall. That makes it a strong bullish recommendation. Uh, and that we expect it to perform three times greater than the market, the broader market in the next 12 months. It uh, gets top marks in five of the six factors we rank on. It scores a 91 in momentum. It scores a 90 in value an 87 in growth and 83 in quality. And it is a 63 in volatility, but that's still uh, well within the green zone. It does rank low in size because, well, uh, it's a $21.6 billion market cap. It is a big company. So that's not, not anything we can really fat, we can really have anything to do with. Um, so to me, the fundamental analysis, the technical analysis, all point to Magna being a really strong company. It's already got, its stock already has an established uptrend. It's got established partnerships and it works both with EV and traditional vehicle manufacturers to produce, uh, to produce vehicles. So I think it's, it's really in that sweet spot. Uh, and I think it's going to even take off even higher as EV, as the EV market starts to gain some steam here in the next five to 10 years. So Magna International, MGA uh, is my recommendation. So uh, any thoughts hey, Matt, on If I, can, if I could just jump in here, yeah. Sure. I mean, first of all, I like Magna, that's a great pick this week. Uh, I wanna make it clear to our readers and, and uh, because it was an interesting juxtaposition that I talked about oil and gas and, and crude and then you came in with a, an EV play. Uh, the thing to realize is, and this is great, you can have your cake and eat it too. This is not an either or situation. Uh, I think that the growth rates of the EV market are going to be massive over the next five years, and there's tons of opportunity to invest in that. I would call that a growth play. You're basically trying to capture the above average growth rates. I mean, this industry is growing at a much faster clip than the broad global economy or the U.S. economy. So this is a growth play. Um, and I do think we are at the point where EV has proven itself and will become a, a much larger share of the market. So that's a growth play. Um, if you're looking at oil and gas, that's more of a value play or a play on the fact that sentiment has gone too far too fast and you're basically playing a contrarian to sentiment. So I think that while um, they, they can happen simultaneously, EV can have uh, double digit growth rates and gain a much larger share of the market and oil and gas can continue to be around and get um, valued at a, at a more realistic valuation rather than down in the dumps as it is now. So I think that, I mean, this is a great week to kind of put those in juxtaposition because I think both plays could do really well over the next uh, several years. Yeah. And that's, I think a very important thing to point out is that, you know, this is not when we're, when we're giving you these recommendations, these are not either this or that. And, and I, this is not a, okay, you can either go with Delic or you can go with Magna. Absolutely not. They're two different, they're in two completely different sectors. Uh, they perform completely different operations. They're two completely different companies. Uh, and there's a way to win using, and they, they may have uh, kind of headwinds against each other to a degree, um, you know, with one being heavily focused in EV and the other one being heavily focused in oil and gas. I think Adam's right. These are completely different plays here. You've got uh, one that is looking at value, one that's looking at growth. Uh, and it just kind of depends on how that fits in your portfolio. And then you've got international paper, which is a nice, uh, a, a nice play on, on, on pick and shovel regarding online, online shopping, online shipping. Well, uh, Matt, I, I would actually argue that yours is a pick and shovel play as well, because you're looking to benefit from the growth of electric vehicles without Absolutely. buying the really hyped up names. You're not Absolutely. buying Tesla. You're no. not buying Nissan. No. Um, you're, you're, you're looking, you're looking to, to capitalize on that trend mm -hmm. while staying away from the hype. So I'd say it's, it's pretty similar. Yeah. So I, I think really guys, I think we've got three, you know, very, very good recommendations. And again, as, as a viewer, you take that for uh, what you will. Uh, you take these recommendations and you can act on them. Uh, and if you do, that's great. Uh, or, 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 you know, you can just listen to our analysis and kind of get an idea of what, uh, what, what things we, we each look for. But we've got International Paper, Delic, and then uh, Magna International are the three uh, recommendations that we come to with you today. And, and I think it's a great new format. Uh, and I think it's also been able to generate a lot of nice conversation, especially as, as, as Adam pointed out, uh, with looking at value and growth and, 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 and two sectors and juxtaposing the two, the two stocks at the end. Uh, I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, 
I'd be remiss again if I didn't remind everyone, make sure you are going to moneymarkets.com each and every day. Uh, check out all the information. We post stuff every day, even on Saturday, even on Sunday. You're catching this podcast uh, either Friday by audio or Saturday on video. And, and we encourage you to, to sign up for our free e-letter. Uh, Adam and Charles and myself, we each, uh, we each post content uh, on a regular basis that provides you safe and profitable information for your portfolio. Uh, if you are interested in learning how Adam O'Dell, the handsome man in the bottom there, was able to uh, retire at the age of 33, uh, I would uh, also encourage you to visit the investingsecret.com. Well, on the video, we'll put the, uh, email, the, the uh, address down at the bottom. And you can sign up for his Millionaire Masterclass where he will point out uh, the strategy that helped him retire. And I mean retire. I don't mean just kind of, you know, whatever and loaf off for a couple of days. I mean full on retire. He does what he does because he really loves it. And, and, and he's very, very good at it. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that. It's the Investing Secret. Com. We've got much more coming up next week. We'll have more Bull and the Bear podcasts uh, as well as our Marijuana Market Update. And then don't forget to tune in on Sunday and Monday for our week ahead, let you know what's going on, uh, what's coming up on Wall Street. Uh, I'm not really going to touch a whole lot on the short squeeze because I think it's been played a lot, but it would be interesting to see if it's going to last uh, and if so, how long. So again, I, I appreciate Green Zone Fortunes editor Charles Sizemore, uh, Money Markets Chief Investment Strategist uh, and co-founder of Green Zone Fortunes, uh, Adam O'Dell for joining me. I am research analyst Matt Clark. Until next time, everyone, safe trading.